I, 34M, found my partner's 30F, hidden journal, devastated and lost, need advice on what to do. Last night, while looking for a blanket in our bedroom closet, I accidentally stumbled upon my partner's journal, tucked away between her things. She had been acting distant lately, staying late at work more often, not talking to me as much, and I had this nagging feeling that something wasn't right. Normally, I wouldn't go through her personal stuff, but in that moment, I was overcome with anxiety, like I needed to know what was going on. As I opened the first page, I instantly realized that this journal was where she poured out her thoughts, maybe things she didn't dare say to me. The more I read, the heavier the weight in my chest became. What I found shattered me. She wrote about how she would take off her engagement ring before work and hide it in her wallet. It was her way of keeping her secret from me and the world. There was a man at her job, a manager. She didn't name him, but I knew who she was talking about. She was planning to start a new life with him once our daughter started school. My head started spinning. Everything I thought I knew about us came crashing down. She described how she felt more connected to him than she ever did to me. She talked about how he was more stable, more successful, and took better care of himself. She didn't say she was in love with him, but the way she wrote about him, I could tell. And the worst part? She said she believed he could make her happier than I ever could. I closed the journal, my hands shaking. I couldn't breathe. How had it come to this? Just a few months ago, I had gotten down on one knee and asked her to marry me. She had said yes, though now that I think about it, her excitement wasn't really there. And not long ago, we were even talking about having a second child. Now she was making plans to be with someone else. I couldn't hold it in any longer. I went into the bedroom where she was asleep and gently placed the journal on the bedside table. I stood there, watching her for a moment. She looked so peaceful, so innocent in the darkness. I remembered all the years we had spent together, all the moments we had shared, the laughter, the struggles the day our daughter was born. I had loved her deeply, and I couldn't wrap my mind around how everything had gone so wrong. What's going on? I whispered, my voice barely audible. I must have startled her, because she stirred and slowly opened her eyes. At first, she looked confused, but then she saw the journal. Her expression changed instantly, and she knew what had happened. I found your journal, I said, my voice shaking. What does all this mean? She didn't deny it. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she didn't try to explain right away. After a long pause, she finally spoke, her voice weak. I didn't know how to tell you. Her words felt like a knife in my chest. She wasn't denying anything. She was confirming that she had been planning to leave me. I struggled to breathe. Every word from her lips felt like another blow. How could she have hidden this from me for so long? How could she have talked about a second child with me, knowing she wanted to be with someone else? What does it give you that I can't? I asked, my voice breaking. Her response killed me inside. He's, he's more stable. He takes care of himself better. I know this sounds cruel, but he makes me feel more secure than I've felt with you in a long time. We've been talking a lot, but nothing physical has happened. It didn't matter. The emotional betrayal was just as painful. She admitted that she had been unhappy for a long time. She had thought about leaving, but her financial situation stopped her. With every word she spoke, it felt like the ground was crumbling beneath me. I thought we were building a future for our daughter together. I couldn't even begin to imagine not seeing her every morning, not being there to read her bedtime stories every night. The thought of some other man being in her life, maybe even helping raise her, made me sick. That night, I slept on the couch. In the morning, she left for work without saying much. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. We agreed to share custody of our daughter, and I saw her every weekend. Whenever I had her, I did my best to make everything seem normal. We'd go to the park, play games, laugh like everything was okay. For a while, it felt like I could handle it. But every time I dropped her back off, the emptiness inside me grew. It was like she took a piece of my heart with her every time. No matter how hard I tried to move on, a part of me still held on to hope. I loved her. Despite the betrayal, despite everything, I still loved her, 
and I couldn't stop thinking that maybe, just maybe, I could fix things. Months passed, and life carried on. One evening, after work, I stopped by a small cafe near my house. I just wanted a coffee, some time to myself to clear my head. As I was scanning the room for a place to sit, I froze. She was there, sitting by the window, deep in thought, the soft light from the lamp casting a glow on her face. She looked just like the woman I had fallen in love with. And in that moment, everything I had been trying to bury came rushing back. I approached her table, and when she looked up and saw me, she paused for a second, but then smiled, a soft, almost nostalgic smile. That smile made my heart race. We started talking, first about our daughter, then about work, about everyday things. Her voice was so familiar, and the conversation flowed so easily, like we hadn't been apart. In that moment, I realized that I still loved her. And it hit me hard. I had never stopped. Gathering my courage, I quietly said, I still love you. Her eyes filled with emotions I hadn't seen in a long time. It wasn't easy to say, but I knew I couldn't keep it inside any longer. Maybe we made a mistake, she whispered. Her voice was soft, but I could hear the same doubt I had felt all this time. Now everything rested on this moment. After that conversation at the cafe, things didn't change overnight. We still had so many questions, so much to work through, but we started seeing each other more often, talking openly about what went wrong. Both of us knew it wouldn't be easy, but the fact that we were willing to try again meant everything. Our weekends with our daughter became more family-like again. At first, there was tension. We were both cautious, unsure how to step back into our old rhythm. But slowly, the bond we shared through our love for our daughter helped us navigate the rough edges. We spent evenings together, taking walks in the park, making plans, laughing at our daughter's little quirks. Though there was still a lot of work ahead of us, each new day was a step towards something better. I felt like the love we had in the beginning was still there, but now it was deeper because we both knew how easily it could all slip away. One evening, we were sitting on a bench at the park, watching our daughter play. She took my hand, and I saw that same warmth in her eyes that I had fallen for years ago. I couldn't help but smile. We did it, I said quietly. She nodded, smiling back. Yeah, we did. Ada for refusing to stop our divorce after my ex admitted her psychic friend lied about me having an affair. I met my wife, Rona, when we were both in college. We hit it off quickly and, after graduation, settled down together in her hometown. For the most part, life was good. We got married after two years of living together, and everything seemed to be moving in the right direction. We had plans for the future buying a house, starting a family, but life has a way of throwing unexpected curveballs. It all started when Rona's old friend, Anna, reappeared in her life. Anna was eccentric, to say the least, self-proclaimed, psychic, and part-time costume designer. She lived in New York City and would visit Rona every now and then. I'd always found her a bit odd, but I didn't think much of it. But when she came to visit last Labor Day, everything changed. Rona started acting differently after that visit. She became suspicious of me out of nowhere, questioning my every move. She'd stop by my job unannounced, go through my phone, and start showing up when I worked late. At first, I thought maybe it was stress from her job or something else going on in her life. But when she finally confronted me and accused me of cheating on her, I realized something was seriously wrong. The accusations came out of left field, I laughed, thinking she had to be joking. How could she believe I was having an affair? I was either at work, home, or golfing with her brother. But she wasn't joking. Apparently, Anna, her psychic friend, had told her that I was cheating and that I'd laugh it off if Rona confronted me. It was absurd. I had done nothing wrong. But Rona trusted Anna's intuition more than my words. No matter how much I denied the affair, she believed Anna. She moved out and went to stay with her parents. For months, I tried to convince her I wasn't cheating, but it was no use. Her belief in Anna's vision was unwavering. Eventually, 
I had enough. My family staged an intervention during Christmas and told me I was wasting my time waiting for Rona to snap out of it. They were right. In January, I filed for divorce. When Rona finally realized she'd been wrong, it was already too late. She and her parents had even hired a private investigator to prove I was cheating, but they came up with nothing. After months of silence, she called me in April, crying and apologizing. She wanted to fix things, but by then, I'd already decided to move on. I was moving to Denver, starting fresh. I wasn't interested in going back to the life we had before. I told her no, that we were just too different. I couldn't be with someone who had trusted her psychic friend over me. The trust was broken, and I couldn't imagine raising kids in that kind of environment. She was devastated, and I walked away feeling like I had made the right choice. In early June, just a month before I was set to leave for Denver, I was at a company party. It was a small gathering, just some co-workers, a few drinks, and music. I had been trying to distract myself from the divorce, to focus on my new job, and the move ahead. But that night, everything changed. Out of nowhere, Rona showed up. I hadn't spoken to her since our last conversation in April, and seeing her there caught me completely off guard. My initial reaction was frustration. Why was she here? But she didn't look like the woman who had stormed out of my life months ago. She looked different, calm, determined. I need to talk to you, she said, standing awkwardly by the bar while everyone else was mingling. I was hesitant, not wanting to make a scene. Now isn't really a good time, Rona. She shook her head. Please, just five minutes. I sighed and agreed to step outside. The cool evening air hit us as we walked into the quiet parking lot. I turned to face her, my arms crossed, waiting for whatever speech she had rehearsed. I was wrong. She began, her voice steady. I know I already said that before, but I don't think you understand just how wrong I was. I trusted the wrong person. I let Anna get into my head, and I let my own insecurities convince me that you were capable of something you weren't. And I destroyed us because of it. I didn't say anything. What could I say? She wasn't telling me anything I didn't already know. I've spent the last few months in therapy. She continued, trying to figure out how I let it get this far. How I could throw away everything we had because of one stupid idea that wasn't even mine. And the truth is, I was scared. I was scared that I wasn't enough for you. That one day you'd leave, and Anna's psychic nonsense played right into my fears. Her honesty caught me off guard. She had never admitted anything like this before. For the first time in a long time, I saw the woman I had fallen in love with, vulnerable real. You could have just talked to me, I said, my voice softer than I intended. All of this could have been avoided if you just told me how you were feeling. She nodded, tears filling her eyes. I know, and I'll regret that for the rest of my life. But I don't want to give up on us, not without fighting for what we had. I've learned so much about myself these past few months. I know it's too late to undo the damage, but maybe, maybe we can start again. Maybe we can be better together. It was the first time since the whole thing started that I saw a glimmer of hope. But I wasn't ready to let her back in just yet. You hurt me, Rona, I said, my voice thick with emotion. You didn't just doubt me. You turned my life upside down. You made me feel like a stranger in my own home. How do I trust you again? I know. She whispered, stepping closer. I know it won't be easy, but I'm willing to put in the work. I'm willing to earn back your trust, piece by piece, if you'll let me. The silence between us felt heavy, filled with the weight of everything that had happened. I wasn't sure what to say, but something inside me told me to listen. This was different. She was different. Maybe therapy had helped her see things more clearly or maybe she had finally realized what she was about to lose for good. What if we can't go back? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She wiped a tear from her cheek and took a deep breath. Then we don't go back. We start fresh. We leave the past behind and figure out who we are now. I looked at her, seeing the sincerity in her eyes. For the first time in months, I allowed myself to believe that maybe, just maybe, there was a way forward. I'm not making any promises, I said finally. But if you're serious about starting fresh, then I'll try. We'll take it slow, 
see where it goes. She nodded, her smile small but genuine. That's all I'm asking. We stood there for a few moments, the tension between us easing ever so slightly. I wasn't sure where this road would lead, but for the first time in a long time, I felt like there was a possibility. Maybe we could rebuild something, something better than before. We started with small steps, dinners, conversations, taking time to really talk about everything that had gone wrong. Rona stayed in therapy, working on her own issues, and I began to see the changes in her. It wasn't an overnight fix, but slowly, the trust started to grow back. By the time my move to Denver was approaching, we had reached a decision. Rona would come with me, not as a desperate attempt to cling to the past, but as a way to truly start fresh, far away from Anna and the ghosts of our old life. We found a small house, and for the first time, it felt like we were building something real again. Looking back, I realize now that reconciliation isn't about erasing the past. It's about learning from it, growing, and moving forward together. And while we still have a long way to go, I believe we're stronger now than we ever were before. Moving to Denver was the fresh start we both needed, but it wasn't without its challenges. Once the excitement of finding a new house and settling into a different city wore off, reality set in. Rebuilding trust wasn't just about big gestures or heartfelt apologies. It was about the small, everyday moments that required us to show up for each other in ways we hadn't before. At first, everything felt fragile. The trust between us was like glass, transparent, but easily shattered if either of us made the wrong move. Rona was determined to prove herself. She attended therapy regularly, not just for herself, but for us. She was more open with me than she had ever been before, and I saw her making genuine efforts to heal both of us from the damage she had caused. But old habits die hard. There were times when doubts still crept into my mind. On days when I worked late, I'd wonder if she was really over her suspicions of me, or if she'd start spiraling into those paranoid thoughts again. Sometimes I'd catch her looking at my phone, and while she'd quickly look away, the tension in those moments reminded me that we weren't completely past everything yet. One night, about three months into our move, we had our first real argument since the reconciliation. I had come home late from a work event, tired and stressed. Rona was already in bed, but as I walked in, I noticed my phone lying on the kitchen counter. It wasn't where I had left it. My stomach sank. Had she gone through it again? I confronted her the next morning. Did you go through my phone last night? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm, but failing miserably. She looked at me, her eyes wide with guilt. I, I didn't mean to, she stammered. I was just, it was there, and I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. That familiar anger flared up inside me. Rona, we talked about this. You said you trusted me again. If you can't stop checking my phone every time I'm late, how are we ever supposed to move forward? I know, I know, she said, tears already forming in her eyes. I just, it's hard for me to shut off that part of my brain. I'm working on it. I swear. I didn't find anything because I know there's nothing to find. But sometimes that fear just creeps in and I can't control it. I took a deep breath trying to calm down. I get that it's hard for you, I said. But I can't live like this, Rona. If we're going to make this work, you have to let go of what happened. You have to let go of Anna's lies. She nodded, wiping away her tears. I will. I promise. I won't let it happen again. I believed her, but part of me still worried. Trust isn't something that rebuilds overnight. And I knew we had a long way to go. Weeks passed, and things settled back into a more comfortable routine. Rona started volunteering at a local community center, teaching kids to sew costumes for school plays. It was something that gave her a sense of purpose, something that didn't revolve around me or our marriage, and I could see it was helping her heal. She was finding herself again. Meanwhile, I threw myself into my new job, working long hours and trying to establish myself in a new office. But despite the challenges, I began to notice something shift between us. We started to communicate more openly, not just about our problems, but about the little things that matter in a marriage. We talked about our days, shared our thoughts, and slowly, 
the walls that had been built between us began to come down. One Friday night, after a long week, we decided to have a quiet evening in. We ordered takeout, watched an old movie, and sat together on the couch. There was no tension, no lingering distrust. It was the most peaceful evening we had shared in months. As the credits rolled, Rona turned to me, a soft smile on her face. You know, she said quietly, I think we're finally starting to feel like us again. I looked at her, feeling a warmth spread through me that I hadn't felt in a long time. She was right. For the first time since everything had happened, I felt like we were on the same page, like we were building something solid again. I think so too. I agreed, reaching for her hand. It's been hard, but we're getting there. She nodded, resting her head on my shoulder. I'm really proud of us. I know I messed up. I know I put us through hell. But you stuck with me. And I don't think I'll ever be able to thank you enough for that. I squeezed her hand. You've been doing the work too, Rona. I'm not the only one fighting for this. The conversation felt like a turning point. Like we had crossed over from just surviving to actually living again. It wasn't perfect, but it was progress. Just when it seemed like everything was finally settling into place, life threw another surprise at us. One morning, Rona came into the kitchen holding something behind her back, a look of nervous excitement on her face. What's going on? I asked, curious. She hesitated for a second, then slowly revealed a small, white plastic stick in her hand. My heart stopped. I'm pregnant, she whispered, her voice barely audible but filled with emotion. I stared at her, not knowing what to say. It felt like the ground had shifted beneath me. After everything we had been through, a baby was the last thing I had expected. But as I processed her words, I felt a mix of emotions. Fear, excitement, love, uncertainty. How, how do you feel about it? I finally asked, my voice unsteady. She sat down beside me, her eyes shining. I didn't plan this. I didn't expect it, but I'm happy. Scared, but happy. I know we've been through so much, but maybe this is the universe's way of giving us a fresh start. A new beginning. I let out a long breath, trying to wrap my mind around the idea of becoming a father. I'm scared too, I admitted. But maybe you're right. Maybe this is what we need. Over the next few weeks, the reality of the pregnancy started to sink in. We talked about baby names, made plans, and started preparing for this huge change in our lives. And somehow, in the midst of it all, we grew closer than ever before. The baby wasn't just a new chapter for us. It was a symbol of everything we had survived. As the months passed, we found ourselves falling back in love, not just with each other, but with the life we were building together. Every day brought new challenges, but we faced them as a team, stronger and more united than we had ever been before. By the time Rona entered her third trimester, things between us had reached a place I never thought we'd get back to. We were excited for the baby's arrival, but more than that, we were genuinely happy. We had rebuilt our marriage brick by brick, and the foundation we stood on now felt stronger than ever. One evening, as we lay in bed, Rona turned to me, her hand resting on her growing belly. I know we've said this before, she said softly, but I really am grateful for you. For everything. I'm grateful that you didn't give up on me when you had every right to. I smiled, kissing her forehead. And I'm grateful you fought to come back to me. We've been through hell, but we made it. Together, as we lay there, the future felt wide open, full of possibility. There were no guarantees, no promises that everything would be perfect from here on out. But one thing was certain, we were stronger now, not just as individuals, but as a couple. We had faced the worst and come out the other side, ready to embrace whatever came next.